Uh, next, we have Dak DiGiovanna uh, with Seven Bridges. He's a program manager there. His PhD was developing closed loop brain machine interfaces using reinforcement learning for control at the University of Florida. Uh, he was a postdoc at the ETH Zurich, uh, senior scientist at the EPFL in Lausanne, working on vestibular prosthetics and the neurophysiology of locomotion. Don't ask me to say that three times fast. Uh, he joined Seven Bridges in 2015 and has been working in program management for the API to help researchers automate and extend genomics, an uh, genomics analysis. Uh, he also contributes to national projects, including the Million Veterans Program and the Cancer Genomics Cloud. Thanks. So thank you, Alan, for that kind introduction. Thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to this audience today. This is my first data summit, and I have to say it's really been tremendous hearing all the different talks and getting to meet you guys at lunch and dinner. I'm going to go through uh, leveling the play playing field for cancer genomics. I'm from Seven Bridges. We are a, are a biomedical data analysis company, and our mission is to connect the world's healthcare data to empower research and improve health. So how many people in the audience are familiar with genomics? Oh, this is wonderful. It's, it's, a, it's a big crowd. Um, I still have two what will be obviously very childish slides for you then. I was going to give the cliff notes of how DNA works. But before I get started, it, it's my privilege to acknowledge the huge team behind this effort. So in the bottom right, there's a Star Wars scroll of all the people who have been involved in it in the last year. I specifically want to point out Brandy, who leads our product department and was the scientific program management manager on the Cancer Genomics Cloud. Dennis Corral, our CEO, co-founder of the company, and uh, the PI on the grant. Yelena and Vlada did a lot of the work that I'm going to present today. They're on the end, the whole metadata team. Uh, wrangled this information and, and they made it more usable. And then Cody and the Viz team uh, built some things on top of the data model that really uh, empowered the data. So the title is Cancer Genomics, but I'd actually like to frame it in precision medicine. So here's President Obama at the beginning of last year announcing the precision medicine initiative. And for those of you who aren't familiar, I can give a, a little hypothetical example of, of precision medicine. So I go into my into my oncologist, and she tells me, Jack, you have leukemia. What we could do is use chemotherapy A, because 60% of patients respond to chemotherapy A. Now, alternatively, she could say, Jack, you still have leukemia, but we've sequenced some of the cancer cells, and we've looked at the genetic variations, and I'm going to use the one next to the president, and for example, we found some variations right here that you have. Importantly, there's a large population of people with similar variations, and they respond 85% of the time to chemotherapy B. So which one would you like to use? Well, I would naturally pick B. And this is the, the sort of the promise, the toy example of precision medicine. It's finding the best therapy for each specific patient. But it's important to understand the space a little bit and give that you know, two slide primer on DNA to, to figure out what we're working with here. So, it's a double hel beautiful double helix strand here. There's four bases. A binds to T, C binds to G. A human genome is basically a string of length three billion, and you have this inside of each one of your cells. And importantly, more than 99% of my genome is the same as yours, and the same as yours. And th there's a reason that they're the same. DNA contains our genetic instruction, so it's telling our cells how do they function, should they reproduce, what should they develop into. There's these specific differences, the 1% that we don't share, account for who we are. So I have green eyes. That's because I have a different genetic pattern than someone with blue eyes or someone with brown eyes. Over the course of our lifetime, we go, I forget the exact statistic, it's something like 60 mutations will occur spontaneously. Fortunately, many of these mutations don't do anything. However, some of them may drive cancer or may drive dysfunction. So this is the landscape. This is, we have a four letter alphabet. It's kind of a three billion dimensional space. We have, we want to find similarity between patients. What could we do? Well, as data scientists, I would jump right in, and this is actually, when I joined the company, I was super excited about this. We're gonna bring machine learning. I've got my trusty multi-layer perceptron. We're gonna do all kinds of cool things, right? We could use clustering to actually decide how similar patients are. We could classify, use classifiers to stratify patients um, 
predictive modeling of disease and response, potentially a sensitivity analysis. I mean, there's, there's a, a wide range of possibilities here. You could choose your own adventure. Now, some of you are already looking at me skeptically and saying, well, cool, you have tools, that's great, but you need data to make this work, to have a chance. Fortunately, we're in the era of big data, so specifically in the genomic space. So here on the y-axis is the number of patients in these uh, large databases. And we're going to talk today about TCGA, which has 11,000 patients. Uh, there's also some national scale projects. So Genomics England and Genome Asia is at 100,000 patients. The Qatar Biobank is up to 350. The Million Veterans Program through the Department of Veterans Affairs will hit a million probably by 2018, I believe is the current schedule. And pharmaceutical companies are also getting involved with just a few months ago AstraZeneca announcing plans to sequence 2 million patients in the next 10 years. At Seven Bridges, we're really excited to work in a number of these projects, specifically the Million Veterans Project. We're in a collaborative research and development agreement with them to help them handle data logistics, to empower compute, and develop new tools. For Gen Genomics England, we're specifically working on graph technology for understanding population graphs of genetics. And today, what we're going to talk about is TCGA. So the TCGA Research Consortium stands for the Cancer Genome Atlas. Their mission was a comprehensive and coordinated effort to accelerate the understanding of the molecular basis of cancer through genome analysis technologies. And eventually, over the course of about 10 years, they got to 11,300 patients spanning 33 different cancers. And you can see here the, the little icons, the little stick figures. Each color represents a cancer. So this purple one is pancreatic, 185 pancreatic cancer patients. This one that's kind of a, a pomegranate shade is 1,100 breast cancer patients. Overall, thousands of researchers collaborated to create a petabyte scale database. And the total cost is, is it varies a little bit depending on estimates, but this was about 200, at least $220 million to collect this data. So I want to go into the timeline because something disruptive happened in the middle and it's very important for the rest of this story. Uh, this started in 2005 when the NIH announced the effort. The first funds came out around 2007 and the data was uploaded. In 2010, there was the first breakthrough paper where they looked at deadly brain cancer, they took the genetic information, just performed PCA on it, and by doing that, they were able to identify novel subtypes of the cancer and stratify patients in this way. Now, there's a lot more scientific results, but I didn't want to clutter up this slide any further. If you search for TCGA in PubMed, they'll, they'll pop right up. And in 2014 is when Seven Bridges got involved as a cloud pilot. Now, the disruptive thing on this timeline is somewhere around here when next generation sequencing became more economically viable. So when this project started, the idea was take a biopsy, send it out on a chip, and maybe we'll, we'll look for a hundred different variants or a thousand or a hundred thousand different variants to check, okay, do I have these suspect mutations which may drive cancer? When next generation sequencing came around, it became feasible to say, here's my sample, just give me all three billion base pairs and I'll figure out what to do with it. So that happened in the middle and that was great news for research, but it, it changed the flow a little bit in this data story. So I'm going to walk you through starting at the top at the tissue source sites or the hospitals where a patient would voluntarily give their samples. It then goes to a biospecimen core research center. And if they were doing chip work, they would send it off to the right here, check for those 100,000 genes and send it to the data coordination center. If it was next generation sequencing, they'd send it over here and it would wind up at CG Hub. And the researchers are here on the bottom right pulling from both of these centers circled in pink and getting the information. So what was the difference between those centers? What was, was this path good or bad? Well, they just had different information. So the data coordination center was the standard provider. It validated all the submitted data. So it had all the called variants, the genotypes, the chips. Importantly, it had all the clinical metadata and the biospecimen data. CG Hub, on the other hand, so down the left side of the path, had all the big data. So the next generation sequencing, the whole genome sequencing, the RNA sequencing all went there. Between the two of them, it was an amazing resource. So there was more than a petabyte database with more than 500,000 files. And 
It's important to commend the tremendous effort put in by the researchers in this community to help converge towards standardized formats, to deal with some uh, previously unseen issues with informed consent. Uh, overall, they collected more than 2,000 clinical metadata and biospecimen properties. And at the time, it was one of the best annotated data sets for research. So let's dig a little bit more into this metadata to see what's going on. At the DCC, if you logged in, you would get a table of about 10 metadata properties. And you could also, if you were looking at particular liver cancer, you could download all the XML files, which we're showing over here, which contained the remainder of the metadata. They were semi-structured. Uh, there was slightly different formatting depending on the submitting research center, so it made you had to parse through them to find what you want. And the patient identifier was a barcode, which was largely formed by the metadata. So depending on the type of cancer, the study, the way it was processed, that would be the unique, unique identifier. CG Hub worked to improve that a bit by introducing uh, new identifiers to cope with the file logistics that was happening. These could be mapped back to the barcode, so you wouldn't have to, for instance, change the name of all the files if the patient had a metastasis or something like this. And here again, you had a table of information, about 20, you'd log on, you'd see 20 parameters you could search by. But importantly, there was nothing on CG Hub that allowed you to directly link to the DCC and vice versa. So what did this mean practically for a researcher? Well, let's say I want to study the drug and stage interaction in prostate cancer. So you know the stages of cancer, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. And a drug is a different chemotherapy, immunotherapy, whatever you like. Well, I would first go to the DCC. This was the center of the processing diagram and say, I want all the prostate cancer files. I would then parse out the XML because I, I was interested in looking, and I wanted to set this up, I want to look at stage two for a particular drug with RNA-seq as the technology. So on the DCC, I could parse out the XML files, and I would know the entire cohort of cases that had stage two and were treated with that drug, but I wouldn't yet know what kind of sequencing was done at CG Hub. So I would have to map to their CG Hub identifiers, pull all the data matching those cases from CG Hub, and only at the end of this journey, I would find out I have end samples. So am I good? Well, I don't know. I don't know the statistical power I need to fit my models. I, I would have liked to know when I was designing my hypothesis how much data was available to be able to test it. And a previously very difficult but very important query is simply, I would like to know all the matched tumor normal samples. This would involve going through this whole loop twice. And, Large academic centers were quite good at this, I mean, as evidenced by the publications, but for smaller centers that didn't have the infrastructure to pull, it, to pull this data down, this was very difficult. And for the general public, it was, for all intents and purposes, impossible. So that's when the cloud pilots came into the story. And this echoes a couple talks that we heard yesterday where the mission was democratize this data, share it with the public, make this data usable. Now, three Three entities were awarded these pilots. Seven Bridges was the only commercial entity, and then there were two academic ones, the Institute for Systems Biology and the Broad Institute. So what did we do in, with this data? Well, we cleaned and harmonized the metadata, and first we wanted to understand what was going on there. So as Elena described it to me, there are many fields to represent or paint a clinical picture. So we took a brute force approach. We pulled all 2,000 of the metadata properties, and we looked at their distribution across the 33 cancers in the data set. We also interviewed researchers. We said, okay, what, what fields are important to you for your analysis? We looked into publications, we got community feedback, and tried to understand what were the most impactful metadata fields for doing secondary analysis and data science. And one thing we, we found was that some metrics were very useful, but mostly unique to particular cancers. For example, prostate-specific antigen, smoking, history, and lung cancer. So we had some choices to make. How did we find a unified subset of this data? Well, heuristically, we did an optimization where we said we want to minimize sparsity, which means all of those metadata properties that were only specific to one type of cancer got excluded. We don't have PSA in, in the data model. But we wanted to maximize usability. So if there was a metadata property that was only involved in maybe four types of cancer, but it was tremendously important, that was included. We eventually converged on 106 parameters organized in 10 entities, which is shown here as a case as a patient, could have a drug therapy, 
could have a portion, an analyte, a slide, and each one of these has their own, you know, this is sort of an organizing structure. This is coming from additional design considerations that there is sort of a hierarchy within the TCGA. So we wanted to have something similar for users and we didn't want to hit them with a, a drop down list of 100 properties. So since we had uh, made this optimization and we weren't sure if we wanted to add uh, different properties in later, the choice of a data model was natural for us. We used an RDF because this allowed us to build on the fly. If we would change the data model, it would be no problem to update the store. Additionally, we could add new files as the data set grew or if we merged in an additional data set and it fit our vision of a graph based search. Importantly, it handles synonyms fairly easily. So while one clinician may chart your data as a heart rate, other clinicians might chart it as HR or BPM, beats per minute. So we can trivially handle this with an RDF and it's a critical capability for future expansion. And we built the whole thing on top of Blaze Graph, which is an open source GDL tool. Summarizing, we came up with 49 case properties. You could think of these as phenotypic information. 47 biospecimen or bio, uh, biomarker biodata properties and 10 file metadata properties. So it's cool to make that model. What were we able to do with the model? So as was our original goal, this was enabling precision medicine. I want to show the data model just because it's really cool. I really like this graph. It's a partial representation. So we have a case entity in the beginning. As you zoom out, you can see the case has a gender, has an ethnicity, has a history, links to other entities like files. And you can zoom out and see the whole picture here. So if you're comfortable writing Sparkle queries, this is great. You can easily pull any cohort you want in this setup. But some of the visualization we put on top of this made it even more powerful. So in this video, I'm going to click through. There is the number of cases or patients on the y-axis. Across the x-axis is each different cancer. I'm going to click on leukemia. And what you'll see as soon as I click on it, the distribution of patients will change down here. And you can see I have a, just about an equal distribution of men and women. They're mostly white. The peak of age, uh, the most frequent age is in the 60s and two types of samples were collected. I can also scroll down if I wanted to look into the specific experimental strategy that was used. I see here leukemia is selected and there are uh, about 5,700 files for a genotyping array. Let's say I'm not interested in leukemia, but I'm interested in whole genome sequencing. I can click on that and it will rearrange telling me there's almost 800 files for head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. I can switch easily to data type or data format and this answers the question that we had in the beginning of just practically do I have enough files to do the research that I want. Now besides the total number of files it's interesting to look into this sample and phenotype question. So here I'm looking at our data browser. We're going to click on TCGA. Click on the case entity and here I want to look at breast cancer. So I pull down to diagnosis, disease type and click on breast cancer. It's going to update the table of files by executing that Sparkle query as soon as uh, we click a new entity. I'm adding in clinical um, cancer stage. So I'm going to look at stage one, stage 1A and stage 1B. Add that property and it updates. I now want to add a sample type of blood derived normal. So I go down until I find sample type, <clears throat> select blood derived normal. And finally, I'm going to look for particular files that were uh, generated by whole genome sequencing. So I go to the file entity, grab the experimental strategy and select whole genome sequencing. Through doing this, and, and I'm going to refresh the counts here in a moment, I can see very quickly that I have 17 of, of the 1,100 patients, 17 of them had this particular combination of blood derived normal and whole genome sequencing. There's 36 files that I can pull. Now, why is this beautiful? B besides the colors and, and besides, you know, that we see this quickly, we, we found out yesterday in Byron's talk that there's only tens of people in the world who can write Sparkle queries. This interface is actually much easier, right? So anybody w has the power to go in. I mean, it takes a little bit of time to understand the organization, but you can click and select this data. If we wanted to go uh, from the example I, I get started with of a, tum of a tumor normal pair, it's simply adding another branch to the query 
and this executes a logical AND. And now we have these data, so we have the 36 files for each type. Now where this gets even cooler is, let's say I, Jamie wants this data. I want to give her this data. We have these files. How do we do it? Well, it's not huge data like I heard about yesterday, but it is over 100, 200 gigs per file. So I'm not going to pass this over on a flash drive, and I don't want to melt your laptop when you try to do compute on it. And this is some of the additional power of the Cancer Genomics Cloud. So I'd encourage you to check it out, cancergenomicscloud.org. Um, in this case, the data can be immediately copied into a project. So this is like an organizational structure or a folder, you could think of it, where you could share it with your collaborators. We also offer scalable compute instances and more than 200 bioinformatics tools which we've curated from different publicly available tools. So you could do secondary analysis. But probably even cooler for this audience, you can write a convolutional neural network in Python wrap it in a Docker image, and then run your own tools right on this cloud as well and perform analysis right there. So this was the potential. What have researchers actually done? So from our about, we, we launched the beta in November. We opened to the public in February. We have about 100 users right now. And this is highlighting what four different groups have come up with with this data. They've identified novel epitopes across cancer samples. A different group has begun predicting survival from tumor heterogeneity, and importantly, whether this is dependent on the cancer type or is an artifact of the variant caller. Another group is detecting novel gene fusions from RNA-seq with near zero false positive rates. And finally, there's a researcher comparing viral infection patterns across cancer types and the relationship to outcome. I added a logo on the bottom of ASHG. This is a conference in Vancouver in a couple weeks where these results will be discussed in more detail if anybody wants to dig in. Coming to the future, um, what we were excited about, of course, is, is federated queries. So after bringing on the TCGA database, we've also brought in the CCLE, which is the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia. Potentially, if you're working on you know, breast cancer research with patients here, you might also be interested to see how are their cell lines developed from breast cancer developing. Uh, so, so this is showing really the power of what we can do. One of the challenges could be, you know, this, this worked for TCGA because this data set was really well curated for research. How does it work when we get into even bigger and even messier data, like the Million Veterans Program, which is pulling in the data, the phenotypical information from electronic medical records? But let's not worry about the future. Let's summarize what we've done right now. We created a model for TCGA data unifying these metadata fields, and the semantic triple store uh, facilitates rapid queries. This model will be expanded, so the good news, the, the CGC pilot finished and the NCI has since uh, expanded it. We have an additional two years, so now we can think about bringing in those metadata parameters that we had excluded. Really importantly for me, practically for, for you guys as well, providing access to TCGA data in this way allows users to bypass the data cleaning and data organization stage. You can spend your time forming a scientifically rigorous hypothesis and at the analysis stage doing the statistical analysis to bear out whether this worked or not rather than pulling data together, downloading data, unifying metadata. This is all already done for you. Cancer researchers are already finding novel results and as a plea to the community, we really encourage data scientists like you guys to join the fight. I want to thank the team behind the Cancer Genomics Cloud and give out its Twitter address in case you want to talk to it, the NCI for funding all of this activity, the TCGA research community for all the work they did to bring this data together and create this foundation for us to build this resource on top of, and very importantly, the patients and their families who donated data to help advance science. Thank you.